table which is being manned by people at the Western Massachusetts Coalition for Palestine. Uh, we have uh, access to the petition which is asking for an arms embargo on Israel. Uh, and you just heard you have to do the maths for you. So please sign. Please sign the petition for uh, an arms embargo on Israel. And there's also a petition uh, for BDS kind of emblazed on this uh, projector behind you, but uh, the organizer messed up. So please, people, feel free to connect, feel free to talk. Uh, she's one of the many people organizing and active in the valley. Uh, we are hoping to meet in a calendar where everybody can feed in with the events are and just build the solidarity and draw strength from each other. Uh, so thank you. I hope the teaching is going to be on October 1st at Veneski 101. Uh, that's the room from 5 to 7 p.m. So that Amherst College, October 1st, Veneski 101, 5 to 7 p.m. Spread the word. Uh, there cannot be enough such series as long as the scale of the injustice is what it is. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sami Hermes. And he uh, is a steering committee member of the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Uh, thank you. I, I realize I should have gone first because this is going to be a tough act to follow. Um, so I, uh, I want to uh, talk to you today about the BDS movement. Um, and I want to begin uh, with just to give you a sense of where we are uh, at the moment, um, judging from the, from the Israeli side. Um, so, BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, is a security, security threat. Uh, with this, a little year, over a year ago, Netanyahu uh, basically raised the movement to the stature of um, Iran. Right? So Iran is a strategic uh, security threat, and now BDS is uh, up there with uh, Iran as, as a security threat. Um, in a speech to APAC this year, Netanyahu mentioned BDS 17 times. Um, he told his audience not to be complacent, even though he believes that BDS is going to fail. He said, don't, don't be complacent, um, because the BDS movement uh, still needs to be vigorously opposed. Um, according to Haaretz, the BDS movement has forced the Strategic Affairs Ministry to provide the Israeli Defense Forces Intelligence Unit with millions in funding for the purpose of bolstering military sur surveillance of BDS organizations. So BDS organizations around the world um, are supposedly being monitored and surveilled. In 2011, the Israeli government passed an anti-BDS law, uh, so punishing any Israeli who supports the boycott. Uh, this year in February, BDS was a central theme as Netanyahu convened a meeting with senior officials and ministers to discuss how to combat the movement. There were demands at that meeting to, uh, uh, to raise $30 million or uh, budget $30 million to combat BDS. Uh, an Israeli study reports that BDS is one of the biggest strategic threats facing Israel today. There will be a need, it says, for um, Mossad, foreign intelligence, and Amman, military intelligence, to play a larger role in, combining, in combating BDS at the expense of Shabbat, which is general intelligence. So they're trying to uh, figure out new tactics uh, to combat this movement. Um, on Israeli primetime TV, uh, you begin to see things like a 16-minute clip on BDS, which actually doesn't mean the movement. So uh, they're, they're struggling to find ways to report on this uh, and, and to, to come up with a sort of united front against BDS. In this country, the three letters BDS have reached the highest levels of government. Uh, several bills were uh, introduced in New York, Illinois, Maryland, all attempting to withdraw federal funding from universities that had associations uh, or uh, funding from universities that uh, decided to boycott Israeli institutions um, and to prevent federal funds to associations uh, that were boycotting uh, uh, Israel. Kerry has uttered the words BDS or boycott uh, in his uh, public pronouncements. And it's also said that Israel might, uh, might in some future time, uh, appear uh, to be a part of the state. Uh, 
BDS has made the front page in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Actually, BJ uh, Rashad uh, was one of the first to uh, submit an op-ed into the Washington Post and put BDS into my mind in a mainstream uh, uh, media. So the regime, uh, the Israeli uh, the government, the U.S. government, are both on the defensive uh, to find ways to combat BDS, stopping it from getting into the mainstream. And um, as the movement is sort of breaking taboos and allowing us to speak out against Israel's uh, uh, crimes and violations. So what is the BDS movement? Um, in 2004, ten years, about ten years after the fall of apartheid in South Africa, and ten years after the signing of the Oslo Accords, which further entrenched the occupation in the West Bank and in Gaza, the kind of hope that BJ is talking about, you see Oslo as one of those uh, moments of providing hope to uh, move the Palestinian uh, question uh, forward. Uh, but really, if you if you look back at the question of peace treaties, even looking at this country, again, making the connection between uh, Native Americans in this country and the U.S. government, these treaties were always used as a way to uh, acquire more land and expel, mm -hmm. expel people. And this, in this country, uh, we have a long history of doing that. So the, the Oslo Accords can be seen as one such moment. So in 2004, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, uh, supported by the Council of Higher Education and the Palestinian Federation of Unions of University Professors and Employees. I can never get that one. It's, it's really long. Um, as well as other key Palestinian unions and cultural groups called for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. In 2005, uh, there was a comprehensive call for BDS by Palestinian civil society built on uh, the uh, call. Um, and here you had an overwhelming uh, majority of uh, society. Uh, it's a uh, call for economic, sports, military, cultural, academic, a full comprehensive boycott. 170 uh, civil society organizations, which led to the formation of uh, the BDS National Committee, the BNC, uh, in 2007. And the BNC was uh, basically formed as a response to this call and to coordinate the worldwide campaign. Uh, so there is an actual committee now in Palestine that coordinates uh, the, the international uh, response. And it's, it's represented by uh, basically the majority of civil society, key unions, uh, trade unions, engineering unions, faculty unions, women's unions, etc. Uh, Palestinian parties, NGO networks, refugee networks, uh, the list goes on, grassroots organizations, uh, and as well as PACT, are all represented in the BNC. Um, so, and then of course PACT uh, handles academic and cultural boycott. So the movement calls on international civil society organizations and people of conscience to impose broad boycotts and implement divestment initiatives against Israel similar to those applied to South Africa in the apartheid era. And I'm going to get to this apartheid analogy in a second. Um, it's the, the, the call basically came out after, um, in the wake of the International um, Court of Justice ruling that the wall in the West Bank was illegal. And recognizing that the international community is completely useless on this, uh, on this issue, that the UN is impotent when it comes to uh, the question of Palestine. Um, and then coming to this country, uh, people have been mobilized largely you know, for, for what, what's been said, that this country is complicit directly and indirectly, uh, providing uh, our tax dollars, so $3.1 billion in aid, but also um, the U.S. Uh, is set to provide, for example, military aid to Israel worth uh, $30 billion between now and 2018. Um, there are over 50 Israeli weapons manufacturers with U.S. subsidiaries and agents, uh, over 20 U.S. weapons makers operating in Israel. So the list goes on of our complicity, and you probably all know the kinds of uh, things that are going on. We do joint training with the Israeli government and so on. So it's really important for us to be mobilized in this country um, against uh, you know, our government's actions. Um, and we're, we also need to be mobilized here because 
uh, Israel is, in this country, exceptionalized. It's treated like no other country, unique. Politicians are quick to announce our special relationship with Israel, um, and our universities send delegates, university presidents, to Israel um, and, and make declarations of uh, uh, solidarity with Israel in ways that they don't do with uh, any other country uh, I can think of. So given our, si our, our government's silence, people had to find another way to maintain sustained and principled resistance, not simply individual acts of courage or expressions of individual solidarity. And this is the key here, the difference between a movement and expressing our individual solidarity, uh, trying to come to coalesce, to coordinate as a one force in order to uh, make, uh, make change to, to power. It's based, um, it, it operates with the logic of pressure, that it will take pressure through resistance for the powerful to give up their hold and seize uh, their oppression. And it's based on three demands uh, that tie the movement together. And they're all based in international law and are rights-based. So the first is ending Israel's colonization and occupation of all Arab lands seized in 1967 and dismantling the wall. This is the right to live free of occupation and colonization, uh, Resolution 1960. Um, the second is respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as is stipulated in UN Resolution 194, the right of return. And the third right, uh, recognizing and fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of uh, Israel to full equality, the right of equal citizenship. These demands uh, roughly uh, correspond to three demographics of Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians uh, in uh, the West Bank of Gaza, the Palestinians in exile, the refugees, um, and the Palestinian citizens in Israel. So uh, it encompasses the, the, all, all, all Palestinians. When we think of op an, in an occupation-only paradigm, we're thinking of one-third of the Palestinians. So when you think of these three rights together, you're thinking of the full liberation of Palestinians and how, how we would, would uh, achieve freedom, justice, and equality. Um, these demands point to a system based on apartheid, colonization, and occupation. So, when occupation and colonization uh, might be more familiar to you when you think of uh, the occupation and colonization through settlement buildings in the West Bank and, and occupation in Gaza. But the charge of apartheid is sometimes new to people. And it's important here to, to understand this term as the movement sees it in its legal uh, form. Uh, we do not suggest that Israel is South Africa one for one. Uh, there are, of course, similarities, but the, the apartheid claim is, is um, embedded in uh, the 1973 International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid. It was adopted by the 2002 Rome Statute of, international, of the International Criminal Court. And that declares that apartheid is a crime against humanity and that inhuman acts resulting from the policies and practices of apartheid and similar policies and practices of racial segregation and discrimination are international crimes. Article 2 defines the crime of apartheid which shall include similar policies and practices of racial segregation and discrimination as practiced in Southern Africa as covering inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. So you can read that if I'm sorry, I'm standing in the way. Um, now, uh, one issue is the question of racial discrimination. Right? This says that it's about racial discrimination. And so the issue is that, as understood in this law, racial discrimination is rooted again in international law, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which broadly defines racial discrimination as any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin. So it's not just race-based, as you know, we sometimes think of it, um, which has a purpose of <coughs> or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal footing of human rights, so on and so forth. And so <coughs> both peoples recognize themselves as uh, national ethnic groups. And so based on that, as on their own self-identification, the Palestinians self-identify as a national ethnic group, there is uh, racial uh, discrimination. 
There are over 50 laws in uh, Israel that discriminate institutionally against uh, uh, Palestinian citizens. Uh, number one amongst them is uh, sort of basic law, uh, the right of return, uh, the right of return law, which is only for uh, Jews and not for Palestinians, for example. But it goes into uh, uh, many different categories: uh, uh, housing, la uh, land, ownership, and so on. So. Uh, BDS has become a strategic threat, according to Netanyahu, and for good reason. It's been very successful. Um, in the economic realm, you have uh, trade unions with millions of members in South Africa, Britain, Ireland, India, Brazil, Norway, etc., etc., that have uh, come out in favor of, their unions have come out in favor of uh, boycotts and divestments. Um, you had a really great campaign in California that uh, stopped uh, a ship from, an Israeli ship from docking. Uh, just, um, There's uh, uh, several uh, corporations that have uh, been, been pressured and have lost contracts, like Viola, uh, the G4S, one of the largest security uh, companies in the, in the world, the Gates Foundation, divested from them after activists uh, pressured the Gates Foundation. Um, so there's uh, the list can go on and on. And there's actually a, uh, an interesting timeline on the BDS movement website, uh, which you can, I, I just have a screenshot over here, um, but you can go through and you can see the academic, cultural, and economic successes that have come about. Um, you have high prof profile public figures from Desmond Tutu, Roger Waters, Naomi Klein, Alice Walker, Judith Butler, uh, and the list goes on. Um, most recently, the academic boycott has hit the US uh, in full force. You have associations from um, the Association for Humanist Sociology, Critical Ethnic Studies Association, Arab American Studies Association, the Native American Studies, uh, Native American Indigenous Studies Association, and uh, the American Studies Association, which is one company that you've all heard of, which was probably the largest of these associations that have come out in support of uh, boycott. There's, 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 since then, there's, since, there's actually three or four more since I put that slide together. Um, but there's also uh, recently 600 Middle East study scholars who signed a petition uh, for, uh, for boycott. Um, and so I'm not going to, I probably bored you enough for these lists, but the, the successes of, uh, are accumulating. And quite fast if you look at uh, this versus the way it developed in South Africa, where uh, the boycott movement was announced in the 1950s and nothing picked up until 10 or 15 years later. So, you know, just to keep things in perspective. And, and since we're talking today um, on, on Smith campus, I'm going to take just the last uh, few minutes to talk about academic boycott. Um, so, Judith Butler calls on us to question the classically liberal conception of academic freedom with a view that grasps the political realities at stake and see that our struggles for academic freedom must work in concert with the opposition to state violence, ideological surveillance, and the systemic devastation of everyday life. In accordance with this, and to balance academic freedom with resistance to oppression, the academic boycott does not target individual Israelis, but rather complicit Israeli institutions. We're calling on the world to recognize that Israel attempts to present itself as a bastion of academic learning when these institutions are part of Israel's military industrial complex. Israeli academics advise the occupation forces and provide legal justifications for the siege in Gaza. The institutions collaborate with the military to develop weapons and train soldiers. They give preferential treatment to soldiers. Uh, during the latest onslaught on Gaza, virtually every institution came out in support of uh, this onslaught and in support of the military. Uh, so the dis this distinction between individual and institutional is important and is not just it's cosmetic. PACB goes to great lengths to provide guidelines for the most effective way to implement the academic boycott while maintaining the principle of academic freedom. Uh, you don't, you're not asked to read this, I just put it here to show you that it's quite yeah, it's, it's quite extensive of, of guidelines. I have the, the web link here. 
um, to the PACPI's website. I urge you all to check out the academic guidelines and the cultural guidelines. I know seasoned BDS activists who don't realize that these guidelines exist. So, um, you know, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't know that. So I, that's why I sort of wanted to. Um, so we, we don't consider mere affiliation. So an Israeli academic who's in Tel Aviv University who wants to give a talk at Smith College is not to be boycotted. It's he, he or she is only boycotted if Tel Aviv University is sponsoring that talk. Right? So there is a difference between the Israeli academic and uh, their institution. And of course, this will this will hurt. Okay, I'm getting that. Um, but um, so it, 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 it might hurt. But resistance isn't supposed to be a, a fun walk through the ballpark. Um, most mostly. It will hurt. Um, it'll hurt the academics who insist on serving as ambassadors for the Israeli state. What is important is that we remain vigilant about protecting academic freedom, but not academic privilege. And this distinction is important. Israeli academics have the freedom to research and collaborate however they choose. Their institutions should not, however, have the privilege of exceptional treatment from our government and our institutions especially when our resources are limited. Awarding a grant, engaging in institutional collaboration, being the recipient of study abroad programs, these are privileges, not a question of academic freedom. So to conclude, what we call for is resistance. And with regard to Israelis, we call for co-resistance, not coexistence. And this distinction is important, co-resistance. Recognizing that, like in South Africa, Coexistence, dialogue, peace, and reconciliation did not come until after the fall of apartheid, not during. During was a time of coexistence. And we ask for conscientious people from around the world to organize BDS actions, events like this one that bring BDS into the public eye. On campuses, pass resolutions in student unions and student governments, um, uh, start campaigns against your study abroad programs, cease collaborations with Israeli institutions. And I, I just want to end with uh, a quote from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, when he wrote uh, in support of the 2011 uh, University of Johannesburg uh, boycott of uh, Ben Gurion University. And he said, Israeli universities are an intimate part of the Israeli regime by active choice. While Pal Palestinians are not able to access universities and schools, Israeli universities produce the research, technology, the arguments, and the leaders for maintaining the occupation. Palestinians are calling on you to boycott these academic institutions, and I appeal to you to heed this call. Thanks. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who spoke so far. It really set me up in a really nice way. Um, I'm going to be speaking specifically about um, the role of Jews, and specifically American Jews, in um, the BDS slash Palestine Solidarity Movement in general. Um, <clears throat> so I like to start off with like a little bit of information about me because I'm a stranger to y'all. So um, the next, here we are. This is some stuff about me, some words that you can use to describe me. In these pictures here, um, the one on the right, so I grew up in a very, very Zionist environment. The one on the right is from um, a trip to the Dead Sea that I went on with my uh, Zionist summer camp, and the one on the left is actually me at Zionist summer camp, where um, on Friday night on the Sabbath we would wear um, these blue shirts that were were worn by the Zionist pioneers in the 20s. Um, so that was that's that's a little bit of context of where I'm coming from and um, how how I was raised. Okay, um, who here has heard of Jewish Voice for Peace? Yeah? Okay, great. All right. So, um, Taking Key is a national organization that has um, local chapters in over 36 cities slash campuses. Um, that's the most recent number that I've heard, but this past summer, since June, there have been 18 new chapters um, have been started, so I don't know the exact number, but there are so many. Um, and I also couldn't find the exact number of members, but what I can tell you is that in April, there were, we had 42,000 likes on our Facebook, and last, as of last night, we had, ready for this, 
two. Very strong sense of generosity. So I like to think of the BDS 
CBS call as like the most generous gift that we could ever have gotten because it just tells us right here, plain and simple, they're calling upon international civil society organizations and people of conscience. So anybody who thinks of themselves as a person of conscience has to listen to this, has to heed this call, and can't just ignore it and decide they want to do something else about it. Um, so here are the demands that Sammy had talked about, ending the occupation, um, recognizing the fundamental rights of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, and uh, the right of return. Right? So again, similar to the, the JDP mission that highlights the, um, the rights and the values, uh, BDS is not a solutions-driven uh, movement. It's very much about justice and equality. Um, Okay, so what does this have to do? Where, where do the Jews fit into all of this, right? Um, there's always kind of that question of being a self-hating Jew or being anti-Semitic, if you, I mean, please. Um, raise your hand real quick if you've ever been called a self-hating Jew. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, right, so what, what's so special about the role of the Jews? What's so special? What do we have to offer?
The second thing is, I would turn the question back. Why is it that the Netanyahu government continues to hold in its presence people who are committed to the non-violent part of the Barbary? And finally, I think the history of Hamas should be on the tips of everybody's tongue. How did Hamas emerge as such an important entity? Why did the Israeli government give Hamas carte blanche to organize when they were at that time killing off the basic rump factions who were part of Fatah, PFLP, DFLP, etc.? I mean, they opened the opportunity in the same way likes to play this game of uh, cat and mouse with the Islamists as they did in Afghanistan, as they did in Libya, as they are doing in Syria. You know, you think you are scared of the left, so you use all these other characters as the bogeyman, then they come in and you say, look, they, they are the, the most dangerous people. So, one, the question of, can I reduce Palestine to Hamas? Secondly, the very people who are committed to a part, the so-called Mandela, incarceration for decades is uh, you know, not on the table, why is it on the table and most importantly, Hamas used to be your friend and then you decided to start taking them out and they became your enemy. They are your problem, not mine. I would like to briefly speak to this issue of protesters from work. Right? Uh, I'll say two things. First is, I don't think it's a, a genuine question because if you look at this statistically, there are two visions of it, statistical and historical. So if you look at it statistically, you know, most diets don't work, you know? Most marriages don't work. Love doesn't work! You know, people haven't stopped doing any of those. So I wonder why is it that only when it comes to protest, people want, you know, a pre-signed check that they're going to get their No one who's LGBT said anything about it. No, the protests had nothing to do with it. Women didn't walk the streets asking for the right to vote. Men suddenly decided internally that they had to do this. Right? India never fought for its independence. The British suddenly decided it was time to leave. Great. Historically, nothing else has worked. So I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> so, you know, so Question. I have a couple comments, so I'm sorry. Give me strength, I need a moment. Thank you all for coming to speak. Thank you all for coming to march. To the white boy with dreads who called Hamas a terrorist organization, um, first, you came into this space culturally appropriating African culture and things that are coming out of slavery resistance culture, so your space to speak is not valid here. You're obviously not coming from a space that is ready to organize and that is ready for movement. When you come in wearing cultural appropriation on your body, speaking about terrorist organizations. If we're gonna talk about terrorist organizations, let's talk about how the United States government, which is a country that was founded on the genocide of the indigenous peoples here and the enslavement of the and kidnapping of African people, okay, which is how it amassed its wealth, is a country that now has um, 40% of people in Detroit getting their water shut off. It's a country that now is giving $3 billion a year to Israel, but just cut $8 billion from food stamps. It is a country that shoots where an, a police officer shoots an unarmed black person every 28 hours in this country, and where our fourth largest city is people incarcerated. So if we're gonna talk about terrorism, right, I would like, like us to look at the designations um, for what we're calling terrorism. Um, and I guess I also wanna say, like, speaking personally, and not on behalf of any organization or anyone, if we're here, uh, we're here for movement and we're here for real change. So we're not just here for like Palestine. We're not just here, we're here for decolonization, right? We're here for revolution. We're here to change these completely unjust 
systems of oppression and capitalism that we live under. And if you're not here for that, then go home. That's all. questions or comments on the questioners or commenters uh, because uh, the last thing we want here is a complex debate which most uh, which has not been resolved I mean the, the debate on cultural appropriation is by no means a debate which is resolved in terms of you know where exactly its lines lie uh, and it's a debate which has a reading list worth at least two courses so we are not going to resolve it today uh, and but we are not going to resolve it by saying that we shouldn't do this or we should do that and let's not speak to each other on the floor let's please enjoy and make the most of the opportunity we have of the speakers here direct the questions to them uh, and we will have time for this debate and it's not going to be resolved this so please not do that so uh, a question from uh, Eli and then from Anna. Uh, I was wondering if the panel agreed to the linkages between um, the rise of the division of the sports in the United States and the exportation of uh, kind of terrorism tactics. Um, I'm specifically thinking the context of Ferguson and uh, the fact that Ferguson is in the police department's training with the Israel police department, both Israeli kind of terrorism groups and military groups, and how those tactics. We talked a lot about the transfers of money and resources and diplomatic ties to Israel. So the link between militarization and occupation yes. is there a link? And uh, uh, Hannah? Okay, um, so I'm Palestinian American, born and based here. Um, I visited Palestine a number of times, stayed there for a few months, um, and families from the village, about 15 minutes from Jerusalem. Um, I often feel like Palestinians in general lose hope. It's remarkable to me 
that a Palestinian can stand here and say, we stand in solidarity with struggles around the world. I mean, brother, We stand in solidarity with people around the world is amazing. For me, the hallmark of the Palestinian struggle is very simple. It's the ability to continue to believe in justice and internationalism despite the fact that the present is still there. Just a response to the um the, the back and forth between the Israeli uh, military, uh, Israeli military industrial complex and the U.S. military industrial complex. Um, I mentioned real, real briefly that uh, you have, uh, I think it is 50, uh, 50 Israeli weapons manufacturers with U.S. subsidiaries and agent, uh, agents. So they're they're trading their weapons here. Um, and so the flow is not just from here to Israel, it's, it's both ways. Um, and, and, the, and the money in, in that sense is also both ways. I think that the U.S. Uh, campaign to end the occupation has a really uh, great sort of, um, bunch of statistics and graphics about uh, U.S. Uh, military aid and uh, working on uh, embargo. Uh, their, their website that has some really good information, that's sort of where I pulled that stuff from. Um, I think the, uh, the issue of, on the issue of hope, I think uh, one, BJ said most of it, but I would just add that um, you need hope, um, but hope without agency, I feel, doesn't uh, necessarily get you to where you, where you want. And I think the, um, which uh, usually you hear in the case of uh, Palestine or Arabic, which is perseverance, uh, kind of encapsulates uh, some of that uh, sense of hope but steadfastness. Uh, so you're, uh, you have hope for future liberation, uh, as Salvador had uh, eloquently put it, that he believes that's coming soon. But there's a steadfastness to uh, to do something about it, and not to just say, "I hope for a future of liberation," but I struggle for a future of liberation, and I'm going to do something about it. So those two. First, I'll answer the uh, relatively easy question about the separation between the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza and the West Bank were separated from 1948 until 1967. The only way to get from Gaza to the West Bank or vice versa was through, through uh, Egypt, Jordan, and the West Bank. There was a period between 1967 to about 1987, the first intifada, that the borders were open because Palestinian laborers would work in Israel. Most of the Palestinians in Gaza used to work in Israel between 67 and the first intifada, and they could also go to Jerusalem to the mosque at East Jerusalem and so on. It was separated again, surprisingly, during the period of the Oslo Accord, when Israel stopped uh, uh, allowing Palestinians to come to work in Israel. They brought workers from Romania, from Thailand, and other places to replace the Palestinian workers. And this is a very interesting contradiction that during the part of the Oslo process was the separation of Israel and, and, and uh, the Palestinians. And so Gaza again was separated from the West Bank. And uh, geographically, there are two separate pieces. There, is no, there was no connection between them. One should also mention that as part of the Oslo Accord, uh, they agreed that Gaza and the West Bank is one entity, even though in practice it was exactly the opposite. Okay, the question of hope. Just like you, I've been going to Palestine, Israel for the last 10 years. Every summer we take students from the United States and from Europe, and we take them for five weeks program between Palestine and Israel. The students have a, a, an orientation tour for one week in the West Bank and inside Israel, and then the students work as volunteers in different NGO uh, community centers and so on in the West Bank. 
So, just like you, every year when I go, again, I use respect to Tan for his optimism, but when I go every year, I see the situation is getting worse in terms of Israel is taking more and more land, and it is absolutely clear that is a plan is to annex the, the area C, which is about 60% of the land in, in the West Bank. In the context of what is happening right now in the Middle East, the chaos, the wars, it doesn't look uh, very uh, promising. I also have friends and relatives who are Israelis. They uh, at least some of my friends and, and relatives are people with open mind. They are also feeling hopelessness. They also feel that there is no chance for any agreement. So basically it is a zero-sum game here, war, war, and so on. And many people in Israel see the BDS as a tool to hit Israel as a way, as part of the war against Israel. Therefore, I suggest for us to think in a term that Judith Butler, who is a, a member of our board of directors of the Faculty for Israel and Palestinian Peace, she talks about cohabitation the concept of cohabitation, the concept that Israelis and Palestinians will, should find a way to live in a place on the basis of absolute equality for the human rights and dignity. I believe that this Direction is a direction that can bring hope to young people because young people understand that war is crazy, war is terrible, war is destructive, and so the alternative to either a Palestinian state in all of Palestine, an Islamic state in all of Palestine, and a Jewish state in all of Palestine, the idea of trying to think about cohabitation people living together on the basis of equality, to me, is a way for young people to think in a hopeful way for the future. Uh, thank you so much. We are already uh, well, well over time, so I'm, I will have to, I did see kind of a few more hands out there, but I'll have to kind of wrap up the proceedings here, especially because if any of you want to join the, I'm going to mispronounce it, help me out here, tell me. The Tashlik ritual out by the Mill River, we do need to wrap up now, uh, so that people can go and join this. This is at 4.30, organized by the local chapter of the Jewish Voice for Peace, and they're meeting at 4.30 at the Smith Boathouse. Uh, so I'm wrapping up here now,
Uh, you can follow the people from Jewish Voice for Peace immediately after the teaching. Is Dory in the room? Can we, yeah, there's Dory waving at you. So everybody, that's Dory. So that's where you go for, that's your go-to person to kind of follow after this teaching uh, with the New Year's ritual to reaffirm Jewish Voice for Peace and the community's commitment to Palestinian liberation and renew our spirits and hearts for our social justice work. So 4.30 at the Smith Boathouse. That is where this is happening. Uh, then we also have endoccupation.org, Western Mass Jobs with Justice, Inter International Socialist Organization, or ISO, and many of our, uh, many of our allies, the people who formed this coalition are present in the room today and tabling, so I hope this is a space where everybody can engage, learn, and re-energize themselves. Uh, my name is uh, Uditi Sen, I teach Salvation Studies at Hampshire College. I will be facilitating and chairing this discussion. So we will start, we have a fabulous panel of four speakers. Uh, so without much ado, I will move on to that. Uh, I'll request the speakers to speak, to keep it to like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, is that okay? Yeah, to about 15 minutes so that that leaves us enough time. Uh, for question and answer and discussion and also some, you know, general interaction and mingling in this room, you know, immediately after the teaching around the issues which come up. Uh, so we will start this teaching uh, with uh, Professor Yoav Elinevsky, who's a professor of the mathematics department uh, and chair at Mount Massachusetts Community College, Community College, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is faculty for Israeli-Palestinian Peace, uh, an educational network of Palestinian, Israeli, and international faculty and students working in solidarity for a complete end of occupation and just peace. Uh, so please welcome uh, Yoav. Thank you everybody. I, I want to congratulate you for coming here, for being active, because that is the only way we can expect any change. It will not come from the top, I believe it will come from the bottom. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Gaza, and I'm going to talk about the U.S. Let me tell you uh, what qualified me to talk about Gaza. I was born in Jerusalem four years after the establishment of the State of Israel. And when I was uh, 18, I was drafted to the Israeli army. And I spent for a, a year and a half in the refugee camps of Gaza as part of the Israeli military control trying to control the militant resistance in the 70s. You can imagine the amazing shock that I experienced moving from Jerusalem to the refugee camp of Gaza. Who are the people in Gaza? What do they want? Is it only recently that they are under attack? My friends, 80% of the people in Gaza are descendants of refugees from 1948-49. The population of Gaza is 1.5 million, 1.2 million are refugees. Where they are coming from? Most of the refugees in Gaza came from the southern part of today's Israel. Some of them were literally brought by trucks to the border and dumped to Gaza. We will not go into details of the 47, 48, but basically what happened and this is important. I learned it at this point from uh, Professor Khaled from Colombia. There is a very good book that he wrote about Palestine-Israel. 
the Arab armies that entered the war in 1948 entered the areas in Palestine that were allocated to the Palestinian state. Not, they did not enter the areas which are allocated for the Jewish state. The Egyptian army, therefore, entered through the northern Sinai and Gaza into southern, what today is southern Israel. And so, during this situation, Israel took advantage of it. And as they were fighting the Egyptian, they were cleaning up all the villages, the Palestinian villages in south of Israel. And these are the refugees in Gaza. Gaza is a very small area. It is the size of Philadelphia, and it is the same population of Philadelphia, about 1.5 million, 1.2 million. Imagine how dense, therefore, Gaza is, as dense as any big city in the United States. Keep this in mind when we discuss the recent attack on, on Gaza and the tremendous uh, 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 suffering and death and so on that the Palestinian experience. It's important also to look at, 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 the, at the big question and ask why is it that a country with per capita income of 32,000 supported by the most powerful country in the world per capita income of 52,000 dollars is attacking a community of Palestinians whose per capita income is $876. Why is it? What is it about Gaza that for the last 60 years, please note, the Palestinian people in Gaza are suffering for 60 years, whether it is direct occupation, whether it is a military attack, whether it is siege, for 60 years. Why? What is it about the people of Gaza that is so enraging in Israel that they are attacking it continuously for 60 years? And the reason is because of the refugees. Because in my mind, the only way to reach an agreement with the Palestinian, to reach peace, just peace, with the Palestinian, will require a serious, humane recognition of the right of the refugees to return and for compensation. Israel has no solution. Israel and, uh, 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 and I would even say that the West have no solution for the Gaza problem because they refuse to recognize the right of the refugees to return. Therefore, what else they can do? Look. I am teaching math. I see Israel attacking Gaza, and I need to remind you the devastating uh, result of the last attack <coughs> in Gaza. At least 2,131 Palestinians were killed, including, or including at least 1,473 civilians, over 18,000 homes were either destroyed or damaged, and some 108,000 became homeless. This is, the, this is the, the intensity, this is the intensity of the, uh, of the assault on the Palestinians. That's fact number one. Fact number two, I'm not sure that some of you saw it in the press, but it was in the Arabs newspaper. By the way, according to estimates, it will take 20 years to rebuild Gaza at the cost of $6 billion. 
again. Why? Why such? Why such brutality? Israel is not acting capriciously. Everything that Israel is doing with regard to the Palestinians is done in a calculated way by very serious people. And we need to ask what, what is going on, why? Well, listen to this article from Haaretz newspaper, Israeli newspaper, from uh, September 14 this year. Thousands of Palestinians have left the Gaza Strip for Europe using tunnels, traffickers, and boats. Testimonies obtained by Arad show the sinking of two ships carrying Palestinians from Gaza, one off the coast of Malta last week, and the other off the coast of Egypt, and the drowning of hundreds of passengers. So I'm saying, I'm, in, I'm teaching math. I love math. I see one such intense, brutal attack against Gaza, and then I see the article that thousands of Palestinians are trying to flee into Europe. I have no evidence to show that the intensity and the cruelty and the punishment that Israel inflicts on the Palestinian has, I'm putting it as a question, maybe, and we should all be aware of it, those of us who are active in solidarity with the Palestinian people, maybe the goal is to push them out because Israel has no solution for the Palestinians in Gaza. And we see some evidence about it. Okay, now, Uh, look, certainly everybody here supports the BDS. It's a nonviolent way to act uh, and try to pressure the Israeli government to move and to stop the violation of human rights of the Palestinians. Yes. But I think, now I'm putting my American hat. I've been here for 40 years. I'm an American taxpayer. Before we are, or not before, maybe at the same time, as we ask the government of Israel to respect the human rights of the Palestinian people, to add credibility and power to what we are doing, and I believe also to reach the goal that we want, which is justice and peace in Israel, in Palestine. I should say Palestine first, and Israel. I think we should ask our own government, the American government, two things. First of all, there is an American law that says the U.S. government should not sell or give because Israel get free money, a free weapon. It's from our money, yes? Israel is, the um, United States is selling, giving Israel weapon while Israel is committing war crimes. We should ask our government as a principle never to sell or give weapon to governments that commit violation of human rights and There is no doubt that Israel is committing war crimes. Listen to the Russell Tribunal. You know the Russell Tribunal. Russell, Big, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher and mathematician. I was uh, uh, first in a, in, in a, uh, went to Vietnam to investigate what happened in Vietnam. Now there is the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. Listen to what, what they say. The jury reported, this is from September 25, actually September 25. They say, the Russell Tribunal has found evidence of war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of murder, extermination, and persecution, also incitement to genocide. 
The report continued the cumulative effect of the long-standing regime of collective punishment in Gaza appears to inflict conditions of life calculated to bring about the incremental destruction of the Palestinians as a group in Gaza. And this is related to what I said, the one plus one equal two. Human Rights Watch, by the way, uh, on the Russian Tribunal, uh, there are two famous people there. Uh, Vandana Shiva uh, from India, the, the famous uh, uh, environmentalist, and, and Ronnie Castrilis, who is uh, from South Africa, one of the bravest uh, uh, anti apartheid uh, fighter and was uh, uh, Minister of Intelligence in the government of uh, uh, the Free South Africa. In short, Human Rights Watch also says that Israel, three Israeli attacks that damaged Gaza school, housing displaced people, caused numerous civilian casualties in violation of the law of war. Amnesty International is saying the same thing and saying that actually uh, uh, they deliver, Amnesty International delivered uh, this week uh, 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 a petition with 187,000 signatures my name is there too, asking the U.S. government to stop uh, supplying Israel with weapons. <laughs> this is very serious. You should know this is very serious because the Israeli military is going to be shut down if U.S. stops supplying spare parts. Whether it is the bombs, whether it is the tires for the airplane, whether it is the engines for the jeep and everything else. Israel is completely dependent on weapons from the United States. This is serious. I will say one more thing, I have two more minutes. We should also ask our government not to commit violation of human rights. I want you to know that Amnesty International is, is referring to violation of human rights in Guantanamo, the NSA surveillance, the drone attack killing people, racism, prison, prison system, racial profile, profiling, and pedophilia. This is violation of human rights. We should ask our government, before we tell other governments what to do, we should be sure. Yeah. We should. <laughs> I will just say one more thing. In Syria, and Vijay probably will, knows more about it, he just came from Beirut. But listen, there is already reports that American bombing is killing civilians in Syria. Don't kid yourself. They, they will give you plenty of good reason. It's the Yazidis, it is there, they are going to help people. But how they are helping people? By bombing people, and the bombing is killing civilians, which is a violation of human rights, and it's, it's a violation of the law of war. Please think about it, and then I will finish. Every day, sorry, every hour, the operation in Syria, according to NPP, right here in Northampton, it cost American taxpayer, it's costing us $300,000 an hour. Do the calculation, I did, I took my graphing calculator and I did the calculation last night. And if you, if you calculate it, it comes to $2 billion a year. Our money. Yes. And it's bombing civilians. Yeah. And the last thing I say is let's not forget the war in Afghanistan and Iran that cost four, between four and six trillion dollars and destroy people, massive violation of human rights. We don't need to go into details, okay? And maybe we should ask ourselves, don't we have better things to do with all these trillions of dollars? <laughs> the total student loan in the United States is one trillion dollars. I think the government will do quite well if they will stop going all over the world and bombing people and use the money and invest the money right here in the United States.